I got to photograph the kid Leroy last night and uh, it was out of control. Uh, I'm feeling a bit old, but this guy's a rock star. And uh, yeah, the way it works with photographing a concert, you're allowed in for three songs, then you get kicked out. But we, uh, we got a request from News Limited basically saying we need pics as soon as you can. So I basically shot my three songs, ran out to my car, had my laptop sitting there ready to go, downloaded pictures, sent them off and they go around the world pretty quickly. But uh, yeah, this got run in the Oz today, which is pretty cool. But uh, yeah, getting to see, I just get like teleported into different people's lives and random situations my whole career. And it's pretty cool that I'm in the pit at a concert last night with like 20,000 people behind me screaming and yeah, it was a pretty cool night at work. So yeah, the theme this month is now and uh, I guess for me, every day when I show up to, to take photos, I'm dealing with the present. I can't recreate things. Once they happen, they're gone forever. They're fleeting moments and uh, my job is to document them and document them in a truthful manner. And I guess what I try and do is be creative at the same time. So I look at ways to photograph things differently, show unique perspectives on things. And uh, yeah, basically everything's digital now, as you know. When I went to university, I, uh, I learned all these techniques in the darkroom and how to use different films for different applications. And it's funny because I've never used film pretty much in the last decade, even though it's cool to walk around with a Holger or a Hasselblad. Uh, you never end up scanning the pictures and then editing them. And so I generally shoot with my phone a lot. I shoot with a little Fuji. I shoot with a few Canons. And uh, yeah, most of my gear for work's all Canon as well. I've got three drones. I use them as well. Um, but yeah, it's interesting just to see what it was like compared to what it's like now. And I work with photographers that have been in the industry for 30, 40, 50 years. And this here is an example of how uh, photographers used to send photos in the 70s and 80s. Um, a colleague of mine, his name is Clive Brunskill, he's photographed 100 Grand Slams, uh, tennis Grand Slams. So if there's four a year, you work it out, there's a lot of years worth of tennis. And he'd fly in from London and go to Melbourne and he'd carry on all these chemicals on a plane and carry this big thing, which is a Hasselblad scanner. And basically they'd set up camp in the Hilton, create a dark room in the bathroom unscrew the phone, plug in all these wires so that they could send a picture and it would take about six hours to scan one picture overnight and then it would error out but then they couldn't call the, you know, the London picture desk and say hey the picture errored out because they've already got the phone set up to this so they then have to go down to reception and resolve the issue and then try and send it again but literally overnight you might get one picture out to the papers in the UK and it's crazy how now we're expected to file thousands instantly so We'll get into that, but yeah, technology obviously has evolved massively in this industry. And I guess if you don't embrace change, you'll be left behind. So uh, it's been pretty exciting to see everything change since I went professional. It's been digital the whole way, but digital cameras sort of 20 years ago were pretty average, whereas now most of the you know, high-end commercial photographers all shoot digital. So it's pretty exciting how, how uh, much it's improved. I thought I'd just show some pictures to start, just to sort of show you what I do.
So yeah, that's a little show reel of some stuff. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I won't go into too much detail because Nicole sort of did that already, but I basically fell in love with photography when I was seven when my granddad gave me my first camera, which was pretty cool, and shot lots of, uh, lots of photos for school when I was at school, did three in art, majored in photography there, and then did a Bachelor of Visual Communication, which was photography and imaging. So that was back when we were in the darkroom using uh, monochrome chemicals and I became a master of darkroom techniques. And uh, it's funny because I spent six years in a darkroom and I've never used those skills ever since. So that was money well spent. But uh, yeah, you learn all about the, you know, the elements and principles of design and what makes a good photograph. So yeah, those skills came in pretty handy. Uh, hours in dark rooms, but it's probably a good thing for everyone's health now, not dealing with chemicals all day. I'm sure it's not that good for you. Uh, but yeah, in terms of what I do, I'm an editorial photographer. So I basically shoot new sport entertainment and I do portraits and that's usually of sporting people. Uh, as you can see from that little reel, I mainly do sport. That's what I'm best at and what I'm most passionate about. Uh, but then I'm, often asked to help out and do other things, whether it's Fashion Week in Sydney a couple of weeks ago or a concert last night. Uh, I basically do whatever, you know, assignment editors need me to do. But majority of the time, there's so much sport in Australia as Australia loves sport and you see how much it dominates papers that it keeps all of us pretty busy. Um, so in terms of editorial integrity, what does that mean? It basically means I'm not allowed to manipulate a picture. I'm not allowed to clone a picture, retouch it. I basically have to just shoot it and do basic cropping, sharpening levels, that's about it. And say, this is Sean White at the Olympics in February in China. Say uh, there were his goggles on the ground over there and I go, oh, you know what, it ruins the picture and I clone, it, clone out the goggles. If someone else posted a photo from Reuters and it had the goggles in it and I don't have the goggles and they question me and then I say, oh look, I removed them, I'd lose my job, that's how serious it is. So. It's like being a journalist and making up quotes. You basically have to document the truth. But yeah, often uh, when you do an event like this, you capture the action, you capture the emotion, uh, you capture reaction, crashes, moments that happen. But often the best moment of the day is after the event's finished. And this was after the half-pipe final, Sean White came fourth. There was kind of word that he might retire. It was his last Olympics. And uh, three quarters of the photographers bailed. They went off to send pictures and do whatever. And a few of us hung around and I'm a bit of a snowboarder so I kind of knew he'd, he'd said it was his last Olympics but kind of loitered around the mix zone where they get interviewed. And then next thing you know, he walked into the pipe, got some photos with his team. And then he literally broke down and started crying and hugged his board and this guy put snowboarding on the map. And it was a pretty cool moment to be at and document and you know, a photographer once gave me advice, uh, never leave the field till the last players basically walk back into the sheds. And this is an example of that, you know, there were still people milling around and you never know what's going to happen after that final siren or final run. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a few pictures here. This is probably my most famous picture, but uh, <laughs> basically it's about the black cat and we talk about now and we talk about then. When I started, you know, the internet was kind of new and there was no such thing as Instagram. Facebook was just starting. I think most of us can probably remember where, when we first logged into or signed into Instagram. For me, it was 2011 in New Zealand. I remember someone going, oh, there's this cool new photo app. You're into photography, have a go at this. And it's crazy how it's changed the world and how <coughs> we're all content creators now. And you know, uh, whether you're a, you know, an accountant or a photographer or in any kind of creative industry, everyone's obsessed with imagery and there's more content creators than ever. And I feel like people are consuming more imagery than ever as well. So that's a great thing for photography. It's a great thing for my job because it means I'm kind of safe. I've got lots of people wanting pictures and even though print media might be, you know, shrinking, online content creators and online publications are just growing and growing. And uh, it's amazing now how many people use imagery and photography to promote their brand and uh, so anyway this is a black cat so basically I'm at a rugby league match and <laughs> it's always cool to think about expect the unexpected right that's my big thing when you turn up to a job I'm shooting a rugby league match next thing you know we're in Penrith and you've heard about the Lithgow black cat or the Lithgow big cat and you know here's this little black mini panther that comes screeching onto the field and next thing you know I look at it 
it looks at like me in the corner and boom, here it is coming straight at me. And uh, yeah, some of my proudest work. But uh, this little cat came screaming down the, the sideline and it was pretty cool to capture, uh, capture it with the grass in the claws. Anyway, you talk about pictures going viral. Next thing you know, this thing blew up on the internet. And uh, it was pretty cool because all these uh, publications, whether it's Mashable or Bored Panda or even the ABC, started running stories on it. <laughs> Next thing you know, there was Photoshop battles about the black cat. And uh, it was hilarious how just a simple moment that's so irrelevant to the world you know, suddenly was trending and yeah, it was pretty cool. So you can see in this board panda one here, 204,000 people looked at this article about a cat running down a rugby league field <laughs> sideline. So it shows you, you know, cats in the internet always people are talking about. People love cats. But yeah, that was pretty cool. But uh, this is from Beijing again recently in, uh, in China. The, the Winter Olympics somehow went ahead and we were living in a bubble there where we couldn't leave a compound where we stayed and it was pretty strict. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to talk to you briefly about defining creative energy and creative energy is important to anyone who's a creative, whether you're a photographer or a designer. And uh, I guess for me, I've got a job, I go document sport and I could do it in a boring manner and just tick boxes, but I'm creative. I like to shoot things differently and I think we all want to you know, differentiate how we, how we shoot, the style we work. And uh, I'm always challenging myself in terms of how I come up with new ideas and just do things differently. And here's an example where aerial skiing happens at night all the time, but there was a blizzard, so it got postponed and they decided to host the heats for it the next day in the afternoon. And, uh, you know, we don't really get these opportunities to shoot uh, aerials in the sun that often. So to get the blue sky, the flared sun, you know, the, the lights are on still, you know, shooting it super wide to give that scale you know, made, made an interesting picture. And I guess, you know, in order to get better at being creative and channeling creative energy too, you have to move on from that fear of failure. And I guess that comes with experience where you kind of know sometimes you stuff up, but at the end of the day, if you make a decision and it's the wrong one, at least you committed to doing something and you learn from those mistakes. And I've missed lots of opportunities over the years. And every time I, I turn up an event, there's something I go, oh, I wish I got that. I wish I was on a different lens. I wish I was in a different spot or I'm on the wrong side of the field, but it's about minimising those mistakes and growing from them. Um, and then again, working with you know, colleagues at a big event like the Olympics, there's usually multiple photographers all shooting the same event. We sort of plan how we're going to do it. Uh, and then the bigger the event, the more noise there is. So with, with an Olympics or a World Cup, there's hundreds of photographers, there's tens of thousands of spectators and it, you can get caught up in all of it and it's learning to just sort of block all that out and get on with the job. Um, so yeah, I thought the most interesting thing for me to talk about would be the Olympics because if you're a sports person, the ultimate, uh, the ultimate thing to do is represent your country and go to the Olympics. And I think for a photographer, I'm not representing Australia, but I'm going to the biggest sporting event there is. And uh, yeah, the Olympics is cool. I've done eight now and it's pretty exciting. And I said to my wife recently, I said, oh, I'm thinking about getting you know, the Olympic rings tattoo. She goes, what are you talking about? I go, well, I've done eight Olympics. And she goes, you haven't done any Olympics. <laughs> You've attended a few to document, document them, but I was just, uh, just trying to get a, a rise out of her. But uh, yeah, it is as big as it gets, right? It's the pinnacle for sports photography. And you can see here, this is at the track and field. There were 500 photographers. This is in the Rio athletics one night. Uh, it's pretty full on and you can easily get rattled by what's going on around you but you know the more you do it the more comfortable you are in those situations. Um, so yeah this is a riser at the end of the 100 meter track you can see here all these cameras see there's no photographers in front of them they're actually remote cameras where photographers set up extra cameras with shorter lenses to give different perspectives and because some of these races only go for nine seconds or 20 seconds you want to try and get as much as you can in that short time because once they've crossed the line it's it's over and it'll never be repeated so uh yeah summer olympics winter olympics is full on the thing with the winters is how cold it gets uh recently in china it averaged minus 25 and with wind chill it was minus 36 some nights uh 
and it's brutal. You're trying to do your job and stay focused, but then also survive. And it sounds ridiculous, but athletes are wearing lycra. And this is what it looks like when a lot of the cross-country skiers cross the line. They stare up at you and they look like they're dying and then you just take their photo and go, hi. <laughs> <laughs> but that's my job. I've got to record what's happening and, you know, we can't sugarcoat, you know, what happens on the field. If someone breaks their leg, I have to document that. If someone comes off injured, it's all part of what we have to do to tell the story. But yeah, a lot of these athletes in uh, the biathlon, they'd finish, it was freezing, and you're breathing that cold air in for ages and you cross the line and literally collapse and it's like traumatising watching everyone basically look like they're dying in front of you. But then three minutes later, they all get up and walk off and they're cool. But yeah, it's pretty intense. Uh, so yeah, this is part of my room. You can see how wide my room was in Beijing, pretty tiny, and all that crap on the bed is all the stuff I had to put in a backpack every day and lug up the mountain. Um, you have these crampons on your shoes, otherwise you go sliding down a half pipe or down a slope style course. Top left there, heated socks, game changer. So basically, you charge them up, they give you warmth, you're out in the cold for eight hours and they last about one hour. So <laughs> your feet feel good for that first hour and then you freeze and it sucks. Anyway, the first day I was there, my boots just disintegrated as well. And because I was in a bubble, I couldn't zip off to Paddy Palin in Beijing and buy new boots. So it turns out there was a photographer from Newcastle there that I knew that was working for OBS, which is the Olympic Broadcast Service. And I said, oh, mate, you wouldn't believe what's happened. He saw all the gaffer tape on my boots. And he goes, oh, what size are you? And I go, oh, US 11. He goes, mate, I've got two pairs of boots. I'll drop them around you. And this is the kind of camaraderie with the photography community. You know, we all are super competitive, but we all look after each other because... I'll see the same, you know, photographers at the next Olympics or the next major event and we all, you know, kind of help each other out. But, yeah, without him, I would have been pretty screwed in terms of doing my job without boots. Um, so, yeah, this is just, ignore the audio, but this is what it's like one night. Cross -training tonight. Just uh, walking up the Patrick. moguls course. Patrick. So this was like minus 30 something. Patrick's. Colleague of mine, Patrick, uh, who's Baltimore, from US hockey. Baltimore. Look at this. And, uh, yeah, it was freezing that night. And just the to get in position, is real, the struggle is real. The struggle was real that night. <laughs> but yeah, getting up the mountain, you know, we're always mucking around, but then once it's on, it's on, and you get into the zone. And uh, I guess the reason we do this is we're always chasing that next picture, and we're we're all passionate, particularly the people that get images. We all love what we do, and we're all hungry to get that next big picture. And uh, because you can't recreate it, often there's things that you like might wish would happen differently when you capture a picture but that night it was heaps of snow you know bucketing snow and the cool thing with that is you get pictures like this which happened that night and you know if it wasn't snowing you wouldn't get that effect and this is the world number one mogula doing a jump off the top the top jump but I couldn't get the black sky if I didn't hike up to the top of the course so it's sort of making those decisions to go somewhere where most photographers can't be bothered like hiking up the course but the reward is great imagery and that's I guess what keeps us hungry. Uh, so yeah, I thought I'd talk briefly about Tokyo. So Tokyo happened last year, even though it was the 2020 Olympics, it happened in 2021. And uh, yeah, we had to learn to pivot. Obviously it was so different to any other Olympics. Just before it started, they announced no crowd whatsoever. And uh, that would have been super hard for the uh, athletes as well, because you have to rise to the occasion with kind of zero atmosphere and every day, I had a tracker on my phone, everyone had to have a compulsory tracker watching where you went and what you did and you weren't allowed to leave certain areas. We had to do these, sorry about the spit, it's a bit nasty, but spit in a vial every day to do a PCR test and log in, check in every day to make sure that you were healthy and if you weren't, you get locked in your room for a while. But the cool thing is you go to these big events, you know, here in Tokyo there were a hundred of us and it was awesome just to see friends that I work with that I haven't seen since two years before or whatever. We always turn up early. There'd be so much sort of research that goes into how we cover all these events, particularly new sports that we're not that familiar with. Uh, so here's kind of a setup at the opening ceremony. Um, I've got two cameras in my hands to photograph what happens, but then I set up these remote cameras as well. And when I take a photo on the cameras that are handheld, it triggers other cameras to capture different angles. And uh, yeah, the opening ceremony is always exciting and we kind of get embargoed information about what's going to happen at the, the ceremony and there was talk there was going to be this Mount Fuji fireworks so that's why those little cameras were set up to kind of capture that and uh, 
yeah, it's always a big occasion, the opening ceremony. You see the Aussie team walk in, it's always a pretty special moment. Um, and yeah, there you can see, this is just extra gear we borrow for these events because you need heaps of extra kit to set up those remote cameras and stuff. And I guess in terms of, uh, you know, shooting stuff differently, we're always trying to, you know, one-up the competition and come up with different ways to do things. And one way to do that is to set up robotic cameras which uh, can actually move and change exposure and focus and focal length all from a laptop in, a, in an office, which is pretty cool. Um, here's one of the robots. You can see it looks a bit like a robot. But uh, yeah, it's all usually hanging from rafters in a roof or a catwalk, or we put them at the bottom of the pool as well. That's one actually set up at the gymnastics above. I think that's the, the pommer underneath there. And uh, yeah, we'd have multiple cameras set up just to get that different angle, because often you're on the ground shooting action from down low and it just gives you know extra perspectives here's at the weightlifting from a remote above and yeah the pool stuff's kind of the coolest i don't do that and this is not my picture but there's a team of photographers that get images that just shoot you know swimming at this level where they're setting up robots they go down to the bottom of the pool with dive gear set it up make sure what lane they're in and uh, it goes back to knowing your subject knowing what races are happening that day which lane do i think we should put the robot in if we put it in lane four, who's going to be in that lane? How far down the pool do we put it? The good thing is the robot can move around a bit, but once you're committed to a lane, you're kind of committed to it. And then above the, you know, that home straight at the track and field, obviously the rings are pretty iconic. The cool thing about the Olympics, which people don't realise until you point it out, is there's no advertising. So every sporting event I turn up at, there's advertising everywhere. And one of my uh, aims is to eliminate as much advertising as I can, because it kind of distracts from the moment. And at the Olympics, all you have is the word uh, Olympics or the host city's name, like Tokyo 2020, or you have the rings, and often the rings make cool pictures as well, so we try and incorporate them. But yeah, it was kind of weird at the Olympics having no crowd. You know, this is, uh, I think, women's 100 metres uh, heats, but you can see there's literally no one in the grandstands, and it was kind of weird, but, you know, as an editorial photographer, not only did we have to have to capture the sport, but we needed to document the news of the whole occasion too. And the fact that an Olympics successfully was held during a pandemic was uh, pretty incredible. And yeah, we had to show that in a visual in a visual way to sort of say, hey, even though on TV it might look the same, when you're actually at these events, it was it was way different to what it's normally like. Uh, another version of that. But yeah, super weird. Normally there's, you know, such an electric vibe in, in a big stadium like that. And then when athletes won, you know, won a medal, won gold, whatever, the weird thing is they've competed with all the other athletes without masks on the whole day. Then they have to put masks on to accept their medal. And then someone can't present their medal. They actually have to put their own medal around their neck too. So this might be a, a picture that's not that exciting, but it's a news moment that kind of illustrates how bizarre... Uh, you know, the Olympics were during obviously a pretty big pandemic and I think we'll reflect on pictures like this with time and go, wow, that was so historic, the fact that an Olympics was, you know, was held during COVID-19 times and, you know, how strange it was that everyone had masks on and did things like this. Uh, so now I'm going to show you a little clip just to kind of get your head around what, what we do and how fast things happen these days. Uh, you know, I talked before about scanning a picture and how it takes all night to do it. Uh, things have changed now and I think we have lots of clients, you know, whether they're newspapers, sporting bodies like the International Olympic Committee expect content instantly. Uh, the Australian Olympic Committee want content when we're at the Olympics. If we're at a rugby match, usually, you know, the Australian rugby or the Waratahs or the Wallabies want content straight away. A lot of uh, newspapers like SMH and News Limited, like the Daily Telegraph now, do live blogs of sporting events too. So they literally want pictures to drop into those blogs as it's unfolding. But yeah, this is a fascinating little clip that sort of shows what happens these days. Competitors are lined up and the world is watching, waiting to see if a world or Olympic record will be broken and which athlete and country will take home the gold. Michael Hyman, VP of Editorial Operations, captured this video of what the race looked like in real time from the stands. Note the stream of images flowing into his computer in lockstep with the race.
Now let's slow the event way, way down and follow along second by second to show just how rapidly we move the world with our amazing content. Our time to market clock starts as Elaine Thompson Hurrah is just about to cross the finish line and Cameron Spencer, chief photographer of sport, captures this moment. Cameron's camera is hooked up to an ethernet cable that we call a tether. Over the next four seconds, the file leaves the camera and lands on a server running an application called Focus, the fast online content upload system. Focus is purpose-built for speed and scale and was created in close collaboration between the ESP team and editorial. So now our clock is at four seconds from when the photo was captured and it has gone from Cameron's camera to the Focus server and is now ready to be actioned by our editorial field team. They are rapidly making pics, assigning metadata, quick edits, and publishing the best photos as fast as they can. 17 seconds after hitting focus, the file is ready to upload to our ingestion system, ESP. The 20 megapixel JPEG file takes just three seconds to upload from Japan to the US West to AWS region in Portland, where most of Getty Images AWS infrastructure lives. Our clock is now at 24 seconds, we are almost at customer value. One second later, the file is delivered over the editorial feeds. The first FTP-based feed delivery that finished for this particular photo was to the Boston Globe, but it also went to nearly 100 other news desks and publications around the world that depend on our speed to be able to fill their news articles and media feeds with fresh and engaging content. Seven seconds later, and right around 30 seconds from the moment the photo was captured, the file's gone through the rest of our ingestion and search processing and is now available in customer search and the API. 30 seconds camera to customer is fast, really fast, twice as fast as we were at the 2016 Summer Olympics. Just to really drive home how ridiculously fast this is. In the time it takes for me to read this sentence, a photo could be captured, transmitted to focus over a cable, classified as a high priority rank one photo, edited, enhanced with valuable metadata, published to ESP, sent on the editorial feeds, and pushed to our websites and API for customers to download and use in a news article, social media post, or TV broadcast. We are that fast. Now you might be thinking that with a cell phone and tools like Instagram and Facebook, that anyone can get content to market in 30 seconds. It is true that anyone can take a photo if they're in the right place at the right time. But in the example we looked at above, two really important differentiators happened. One, we had one of the best sports photographers in the world behind the camera. Our staff know how to create content that resonates with our customers and becomes iconic. And two, we also had a team of editors applying meaningful and accurate metadata so that customers can trust that they have the right personalities and caption when they use the photo in their own publications. So yeah, I just put that together this morning, so I hope it sounded all right. But uh, yeah, basically, you know, you talk about now, clients want imagery now. There's no, oh, we'll get it to you in an hour or two hours time. It's like 25 seconds later, they want the picture of the moment and it's pretty crazy, the technology, and this was just after that one you saw of Elaine celebrating. She came around the bend straight at me and celebrated straight down the barrel. And before that happened, I was pretty nervous. It's a big race. And in 10 seconds, you know, when all the athletes are right next to each other, it's hard to pick who's going to win. So you kind of have one eye looking at the big screen where you see them coming down the 100 metre track. Then at about the 80, 85 metre mark, you have to commit to one of them because you have such a tight lens, you can't sort of move around, you, you go, all right, I think Elaine's got this. And sometimes you get it wrong, but that's why you have a big team and lots of remote cameras set up. Uh, this time I was on the right athlete, Elaine screamed, running straight at me and yeah, got that shot, which I was pretty excited by. But yeah, I was super nervous before it. Adrenaline's going, freaked out, what if I miss it? Didn't sleep that well the night before. So I'm not pretending that it's all easy and I'm a rock star and I just go and take pictures and whatever. It's pretty hard and it stresses me out. But once the big blue ribbon events like the 100 metres are complete, you can kind of relax a bit, whether it's in the pool or at the track. 
Uh, it's good to get good images of the big moments. And yeah, this is stuff that kind of came out pretty much straight after you know, she crossed the line. Uh, so yeah, at the Olympics, obviously every Olympics they introduce new sports as well and finding ways to shoot things differently is always challenging. But if it's a new sport, obviously it's a blank canvas and you can go have some fun. And what we tend to do is go to these venues before competition starts and shoot practice. And the good thing about shooting uh, training and practice is you get to go places you're not allowed to go during competition. So top left, I'm behind the rings, obviously broadcast don't want to see me on TV when they're shooting the event. So you go in there and shoot wide shots with the rings in the foreground and try and do things differently before you know the real competition starts. Um, but yeah, at the track, we have photographers scattered all around uh, the venue. This is called the moat, which is the head-on spot where you get them coming straight at you and it's the hot seat because it's the most important pictures. Uh, but in front of you, you can see here, these are all remote cameras. So I'll have a a hardwired remote put on top of my camera and every time I click a photo it's firing about nine other cameras. Uh, so there's a lot of prep that goes into these remote cameras because you preset the focus so you kind of predict what's going to happen but some lenses might cover all the lanes, some might cover lane three and four, some might cover lane four, five and six. Then you might do a wide one just to show some atmosphere or the empty stadium was obviously a, an important picture to document as well. And that's the kind of picture you get when you're inside the moat. Usually it's emotion when they cross the line and stuff. And because you're really low, it, it makes a really nice angle. Then you do things like long jump, triple jump. And yeah, it's pretty glamorous. You get covered in sand every time someone lands in the pit. Uh, but yeah, you get these cool pictures. Obviously, when you have a crowd, the pictures are more interesting. But you can see what it looks like. You know, it's still important to, to illustrate the empty grandstands. And yeah, Tokyo was 35 degrees every day and then it would pour with rain and it was so hot that you wouldn't even bother with wet weather gear because you'd just dry out pretty quickly and it was sort of hot and humid and gross. So yeah, we got wet some nights, but again, the rain elements adds uh, another dimension to pictures. So you kind of like the rain, it, it makes pretty cool moments. Uh, this is the office for the week. Uh, track and field goes for nine days. You can see all the wiring. Uh, a lot of that's broadcast too, but you saw that picture before with like 500 photographers. The cool thing with infield is they only let about eight photographers on the infield ever. And because I work for a big agency, and Getty Images, you know, you have Reuters, AFP, AP, EPA. We're pretty much the only ones allowed on the inside and it's because we have the most clients to provide content to and we're the most experienced professionals that, you know, they can kind of trust what we do and we don't get in athletes way. And, Cool thing is we get to get pictures that a lot of other photographers don't get to get, so we're lucky in that respect. But it's also hard work because at track and field, there's often two or three events going on at the same time, so you really need to plan with your colleagues who's doing what. For this race, who's gonna do the finish line, who's gonna do the run around, who's gonna do the start. What if high jump's about to do the final jumps at the same time as this track event, so there's, it's a, it's hard. <laughs> it stresses me out, but yeah, I get to do it again in July in Oregon. Uh, World Athletics is happening there, but it's good to push yourself every now and then. These are the remote cameras on the inside of the track. So we spend the afternoon before the night session getting them all ready. And uh, there's one of my colleagues in blue there, pre-focusing the cameras on, I think, lane three and four there. And another guy standing there, lane two, you kind of predict what's gonna happen. And I think that's the skill we have to anticipate scenarios. And so you kind of, know who, who's probably going to win and work out, all right, if this person's going to win, what are they going to do, what lane are they going to be in? And you kind of hedge your bets where you're going to get something and there's so many photographers there. I think we had maybe seven at that final and we were firing about 20-something cameras. And that's basically what you get from that camera. So this was Marcel Jacobs crossing the line from Italy. Big, big story, you know, after a same bolt for all these years, we had a new 100-metre winner now that uh, Bolt had retired. So that was pretty exciting to get that. And then with COVID, normally you might have, out of those eight photographers, you might have four that get to do the run around, which is basically go on the track and chase the winner around. And because of COVID, they let one photographer in the world do the run around. And for this 100 metres, I got to do the run around, which was pretty cool. So I had new shoes, new socks. Uh, <laughs> had to look good in front of a few hundred million people watching it on TV. Uh, my kids got excited when they saw me. But yeah, 
that's the kind of another pinch me moment where you're like, I'm the first person in the world to interact with this person who's just won the 100 metres. And it's a pretty exciting feeling when you're right there in their face, bothering them with a the camera. But you, you don't uh, manipulate the situation. You're like a fly on the wall and you just document what happens. So yeah, he's not really looking at me. Sometimes they might react to, but I'm not encouraging interaction. I'm just there to, to sort of capture as it happens. Uh, so yeah, talking about camera techniques, shooting slow shutter speeds for visual effect or creativity. Uh, you can see in that top left picture, I kind of had this idea in my head. I pan as the athletes come on the hurdles and then the big steady cam, rail cam with the big broadcast cameras on it completely blocks me and then I'm swearing and carrying on and grumpy and want to go home and then you go, you know what, let's reset and we'll try and get it in another race and then got it a few races later, but it's very hit and miss, these, these moments, they're fleeting, like I said, and sometimes you miss them and you go learn from your mistakes and try and get them in another opportunity. Uh, again, often a lot, of, a lot of it's got to do with luck. You know, the guy in blue here happens to be perfectly in the legs of the guy in the red and it's just a really nice shape and, you know, I might have shot 800 pictures of the steeplechase and that's my favourite one, but sometimes you get nothing that exciting out of it and sometimes you get a picture you really like. Uh, using wide lenses, flaring sun, creative effect, blah, blah. But yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> I don't get too caught up in the technical side of it, but yeah, it's just, you know, shooting stuff differently. Uh, often you look at nice shapes. This is after the, uh, you know, women's septathlon, everyone's exhausted, final race, they're all lying on the ground exhausted and it's just a really cool shape and things like this sort of unfold in front of you and you just sort of see things happen and it's all again in that now moment you sort of there and you might see something and go oh that looks cool if I'm low you know I get the crowd but what if I'm up high it's the nicer shape and cleaner just with the track you know the tartan surface so you're often looking for things like that and yeah you can see obviously it's not just me there it's we're in a big team and it was hard in both Tokyo and Beijing from the moment I walked out of my hotel room to the moment I came back at night, I had to wear a mask and everyone did and you ended up almost with like lacerations behind your ears from the elastic because you're wearing it for sometimes 16, 18 hours and you know if you guys have ever had to wear one anywhere for work, you know what it's like for a few hours. Um, but yeah, here's a remote picture of the team at the end, pretty exciting, we got it done. Uh, and then, yeah, this was the flame. So obviously every Olympics there's a cauldron and uh, people that obviously can't go to the Olympics get to go and see the cauldron and here they weren't even allowed to stop to see the cauldron. So the Japanese public, if they turned up to view it, they had to walk in like a, a nice manner around it and have a look and keep walking and this guy wasn't that excited that I posed for a picture. But yeah, that's how crazy, you know, the rules were over there. But yeah, I'm just going to talk about my three favourite pictures to kind of wrap up before we go to a bit of a Q&A. Uh, again, things sometimes happen which you don't expect and I mentioned before, often the best picture from a, an event is after the event finishes. And this was at the Hong Kong Rugby Sevens uh, 2014 and the New Zealand team, they did a haka after they won the gold medal or the, won the trophy and normally the haka happens, you know, when you photograph the All Blacks before the match starts but these guys had just won, won the trophy, won the championship, and they decided to rip their shirts off. It was torrential rain. I put my second camera on the ground, and I reckon about three minutes later it was waterlogged and just died completely, and it was like a probably six grand mistake. Uh, but I got this picture. Everyone else ran off into the media room to send their pictures and get out of the rain, and I'm like, you know what, this will be mega if it happens, and it did, and it's a picture I love uh, because of, I guess, what went into capturing it and the raw emotion in it, you know, I think if, you're, if you have a picture that evokes emotion with a viewer, you know, generally it's a picture that resonates and people like it and uh, yeah, it's spine tingling when you see a haka particularly up close like that. Um, this next picture, you know, in my whole career, there's not many pictures where I kind of go, you know what, this one is close to perfect because often there's something that bothers you about an image, whether it's the background or the lighting or whatever. I'm going to show you a little video of what happened before I show you the picture. So this is the moment. I'm going to do a little barbecue. Oh, come on. I'm not kidding. Oh, come on. Right next to the court. Check this out. Wow. 
How can you dive like that on a hard court? Look at this. So that's Gail Monfils, French tennis player. She decides to change direction. Down, dives for high, parallel with the ground. To try and return the ball. Injured himself in the process. And uh, here's part of the sequence with image four eliminated, because we'll get to that in a sec. But uh, yeah, basically you can see I'm up in the catwalk, which is above the, the uh, tennis court. And the awesome thing with the Australian Open in Melbourne is we get incredible access. Australian light is super bright and super harsh. And you know all the European photographers are stuck in pouring miserable UK over January. And they look at pictures coming out of Melbourne. I'm like, are you serious? How good is your life? And uh, anyway, this is the picture. So you kind of look at ball placement, shadow, hair, the red shirt, uh, you know, the fact Gail's flying in the air. And yeah, that never happens. I've shot 20 years of tennis and no one ever dives on hard court. Occasionally it happens at Wimbledon or the French, but to be flying like that uh, is pretty rare in tennis. And even if you did a big commercial shoot and tried to set it all up, you probably wouldn't even get the emotion and the grit and everything and the veins and the sweat and everything like in this picture. So even you can see the dreadlocks in the shadow are pretty cool and the fingertips. So yeah, that's probably my favorite picture I've ever taken for, for work. Obviously I've got great pictures of my kids, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, it probably will never happen again. And that's the cool thing about chasing big pictures. You know, you just wait and wait and you're patient and people are, oh, you're lucky. You just happen to be in the roof that day. But I also did 20 grand slams waiting for something big to happen. And that was the moment that happened, which was cool. And yeah, I thought I'd, I'd finish on a sane bolt. So I guess as a sports photographer, if you ever get to shoot a goat greatest of all time in any field, whatever they do, whether it's Kelly Slater, Roger Federer, Serena Williams, the same bolt, Michael Jordan never got to shoot him, but that would have been cool. But uh, yeah, basically photographing Bolt, uh, I got to shoot him at multiple world championships, com games, Olympics, and uh, yeah, so much prep goes into capturing, I guess, the world's fastest man or any, any event which happens quick. And you know, you talk about drawing from your setbacks and experience. This was in London and I, I wasn't that experienced shooting track and field. So that's back in 2012. So we're talking eight years ago. But uh, I decided to shoot a bit slow, you know, with a shutter to give a sense of movement. And I'm on the outside of the track and he's coming into the finish in the lead. And then I forgot there's a finish post in the way when he crosses the line. And he's done the big, sh like the hush to the crowd. And it's a mega picture that's ruined by the Omega timing clock. But as I mentioned before, I can't go and clone out that or it's basically a moment that's gone now. And without that, it would have been a pretty big moment because he cemented himself as obviously the world's best runner. And uh, I thought, oh, you know what? Once he crosses the line, I'll get something, you know. I've got the clock in that one, but there'll be something good that happens in a second. And yes, there's the, uh, <laughs> the rail camera. So you can see some days aren't meant to be. And, you know, I was probably throwing cameras by then and swearing and whatever. But yeah, you learn from these moments. Um, but yeah, we all have fun doing what we do. We love uh, the opportunities we get. Obviously, we're all hungry. We're all passionate, particularly, you know, the colleagues of mine at, at Getty Images. I've got great admiration for all of them. And then, obviously, I get to hang out with other sports photographers from around the world that all have a similar, similar drive and similar passion. And yeah, here, I'd say we're not brain surgeons, and we're not. It's like we're here to be creative, document history, but also enjoy it at the same time. And whenever we do big team meetings and briefings and We've even had sports psychologists on board to get us in the right mindset. At the end of the day, if you're not in the right frame of mind and you're not enjoying yourself, then you're probably doing the wrong thing. And I think for me, you know, I'm grateful that I've had the opportunities I've had and I've been able to travel and see some pretty historic moments. And yeah, all the prep, same with Bolt, you know, when he runs, he's smiling and he's having a good time and he's a show pony on the track. And it's because all the hard work's done in the prep and the training leading up to that moment. So he's out there looking cool as, and yeah, the bolt pick itself was this one. You've probably seen it. Uh, this is my most well-known picture. A couple of little things bother me about it, but uh, it, uh, it was kind of weird because that night, was, it was actually the semi-final. It wasn't the final of the 100 metres. And 
I knew how many photographers were there at the track for Getty Images that night and I decided I was going to shoot a slow shutter and to do that because it's only kind of eight, nine seconds till he, he passed me at the 70 metre mark there where I thought, you know what, he'll be in front. I kind of held my breath, panned the camera, he comes past. And if he was looking straight ahead in that picture, it would have just been another pan of a same bolt. But the fact he's uh, smiling at me pretty much uh, made it the picture it is. And as soon as he crossed the line, I kind of realised it was a special moment. So I ran to my laptop. This is before Ethernet straight into camera. So I ran to my laptop, downloaded the card, and then I had to reset and get ready for the final that was coming up. And the high jump finals was also going on at the same time. So I had to shoot the high jump finals, then go back to the track for the men's 100 metres final and next thing you know my phone's vibrating and it's vibrating you know normally you just ignore it but then it vibrated for like two hours and I'm like what's going on and it was everyone sending me stuff that basically this picture had blown up and I didn't realise at the time but I had to kind of just focus on doing the 100 final and again I got to do the run around with Bolt but that time it was uh, about six of us that did it but I'm like I've got to be there first so as soon as he crossed the line, I've sprinted to him to get him and I'm like, I hope I don't pull a hamstring in front of the world. <laughs> but uh, yeah, got there and uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. You know, we probably will never see an athlete like this again for a long time, particularly in athletics. Um, and yeah, all my friends at work called me Hollywood the next day because I did probably 24 hours of media just talking about the picture, which was pretty cool. And that was 2016 when I peaked and now I'm like, <laughs> it has been, but... I'm still out there trying to make, make ends meet. But uh, yeah, here's some examples. He was on the Ellen Show. They talked about the picture. This one's kind of cool. This is a year later where Bolt said he's already in next year on New Year's Eve. He's like so fast. He's in the next year. Graham Norton talked about it with him on the show. And yeah, the coolest thing about the whole experience was at the end, we knew it was his last Olympics. He'd done three, uh, three Olympics. He'd won three golds in three Olympics, so nine gold medals altogether. So we got a print done, signed it for him. I just signed a little signature on the back and then I asked him if, if he'd sign one for me. So the picture I've got is on my wall at home and it's the only work picture in our house that I've got anywhere framed that's on a wall, which is kind of cool because I don't like, I think you get sick of pictures, like your own pictures, you kind of evolve and like things and then you, you don't. So I shouldn't have got the tattoo with him on my butt. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, it was a pretty cool moment. and. Uh, yeah, one I'll always remember. So I guess in conclusion, uh, you know, back to the theme of now. Now is shifting, you know, the way we capture things now is always evolving. I think you need to stay fresh, whatever profession you're in, and identify that you need to adapt in terms of how you shoot, how you are creative, and draw on things that inspire you to keep evolving. And um, yeah, one way to do that is that work-life balance. Often I go ride my bike for two hours and just think about things and often it ends up back at photography and because it's something I'm so passionate about but uh, I bounce ideas off other photographers, we're always sharing stuff, I'm always on Instagram. I, my phone said to me earlier this week, congratulations you're down 10% on your phone this week to 5 hours 20 minutes a day or something which is great news. But uh, yeah a lot of that is Instagram but you know I love looking at photography, I follow lots of fashion photographers, I follow lots of architectural photographers, uh, celebrity photographers and then obviously lots of sports photographers as well but they all inspire me in some way and I mentioned before I do a bit of portraiture as well so you know it doesn't matter where you draw that inspiration from but yeah I guess come a couple of my points here you know not just goals it's important to have goals but also identify that you need a process and you need to kind of work to a a system in order to get to those goals but don't put too much emphasis on the goals because once you achieve them then what and then if you don't achieve them you feel like you failed so it's important to have goals if they help you get to somewhere but also identify that the process is all just as important because you keep learning as you're going right um, and yeah I guess that's pretty much it from me uh, this is actually from a blimp so I don't know if you remember and this is the cool thing about my job again. Uh, remember there was that Goodyear blimp and it was appliances online blimp that floated around Sydney for a while. Uh, we got in touch with the guy and I'm like, oh, this is a cool story. We'll, we'll photograph your blimp and, and document how it works. And part of my idea was let's do that, but then let's also photograph Sydney from the air for eight hours because that'll be awesome. And 
you know, I was in this blimp for longer than a flight to Singapore, just bobbing around Sydney, and it gave so many opportunities to like capture the city from above. And yeah, so I got the drones every now and then. We get to go in choppers, but uh, yeah, this is just from that blimp, which was pretty cool. But yeah, I appreciate you all giving up some time this morning, and hopefully, I've inspired you. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Absolutely, yes. Um, so, yeah, over there and then there. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, so, does your agency own your images? Yeah, so Getty Images owns full copyright to everything I do, which is interesting uh, How because. Do you feel about it? Well, it's an interesting one as a photographer because copyright is an important thing, but they also pay my salary and I get commission off all my photography and there's bonus systems in place and uh, if I didn't work for Getty Images I wouldn't get the opportunities and the access I get to do things the way I do them and uh, the trade-off is the security of having a full-time job which is rare in this field and you know with a little family having you know the ability to have holidays and travel and sick days and uh, there's plenty of benefits that kind of balance off that argument but uh, it's pretty standard with you know, an agency model that they retain copyright. And if you don't like that, you can be a contributor. And the way that works is you contribute your content to a website such as Getty Images, and then you take a royalty split where you make money every time a picture sells, the company makes money when it sells as well. And then uh, the way it works is if you go, you know what, I'm not making much out of this, I'm gonna pull all my content, you still retain that copyright. But some people go that direction and a lot of the world's best celebrity photographers like the contributor system because they make a lot of money from sales, right? You know, you look at how many magazines are still out there that are celebrity driven magazines versus say sport. And a lot of contributor photographers might not get the access to cover some of the events we do as agencies because it, it is quite strict in terms of access and the way they vet out people that just want to be there to watch a match. Mm. Too. So, um, have you ever had those moments that you didn't have a professional camera and you saw a team take it to the really like basic one and it went quite viral? Have you had that moment? Uh, not, not a viral picture or anything like that, but I used to live in uh, Kirribilli, Neutral Bay there near the bridge. And I remember I used to go for walks early in the morning and one morning I went for a walk. This is back in the Blackberry days, so before an iPhone. And there's this mega double rainbow that came out and I had a Blackberry and I'm taking a photo and it was so bad and I'm like, after that I'm always going to have a little point and shoot in my pocket, on my hip, whatever. And that lasts for about a month and then you're like, this is a hassle carrying this thing. But iPhones now are so good, like whether you're capturing 4K video or, you know, HDR stills, the, the quality is really good. And you can't print, you know, a print this big on your wall and it looks amazing, but how often do you print photos from your phone? A lot of it, you know, you're looking at on screens, right? And so... For that kind of quality, phones are awesome and the best camera you can ever have is the one you have on you, right? So people always say that, but it's true, you know, I'm a big fan of the iPhone and I just looked at my phone yesterday because it was something I was going to talk about earlier, but I've got 39,500 images on my recent reel on my phone at the moment and it's an iPhone 13, so it's not that old. So it shows you like I use it consistently. Even last night at Kid Leroy, I'm walking out, three songs, you're out, and I'm walking up the stand and I turn around and see the crowd and I get my phone out and take a couple of pictures of like the whole arena just because they look cool and I hadn't been in that kind of environment for so long where you got 20,000 people going mental. So yeah, you, you're always pulling it out, taking photos or something. Mm. Who else had a camera? Oh, Cam, you can... Uh, up the back. I'm, uh, I'm interested in what you sort of learned from when things haven't gone right. Like have you had any major assignments where you've come away and you haven't got the shot? You haven't got any image that they've run from it? And what have you sort of learned? Yeah, I mean, I guess an interesting one would be Indigenous Round, Sydney Swans a few years ago. Uh, Adam Goods, you know, he was in the news a lot because of some controversy that happened with, you know, some offensive comments from the crowd a few games before. And during the Indigenous Round, he kicked an amazing goal and did this kind of 
spear, dance, running towards the crowd, and it was like incredible. And I'm at the opposite end of the field watching him run away from me, you know, 150 metres away going, oh, I should be up that end. And sometimes it just isn't your, you know, isn't your day. And it's funny because there were three photographers there that night and I think two were in this corner, one was in this corner and he did it in the far end corner. So no one had a good picture of it. It was all just on TV that you saw that kind of footage. And uh, you get asked, you know, bosses, managers go, how'd you go with that picture? What happened? And, you know, sometimes you miss it. And I guess that's the challenge. And often at major events, that's why we have multiple photographers or you set up remotes to kind of get more angles than possible if there's only a limited number of you there. Uh, I've driven up the freeway to a job, of, I think it was an A-League match in somewhere way out like Port Macquarie and realised all my batteries are on charge back at home for my cameras. <laughs> and you can't just like go to you know, a petrol station and buy double A's. They're like pretty serious batteries. And I ended up having to ring around I rang some professional photography shops and they go, yeah, we don't stock those batteries in Port Macquarie. And then I went, all right, I'm going to Google professional photographers. First guy I rang, he answers. And I go, oh, hi, mate, random question. Uh, I left my batteries on charge, I'm a professional. And he goes, mate, I'm in Egypt. And I go, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and he was on holidays, literally. And I'm, I'm so sorry. And it was like middle of the night and he was grumpy and ended up finding a Nikon photographer so I shoot Canon, a Nikon photographer up there. I gave this spiel where I'm like, mate, I'll give you my kit, leave it at your house, you give me your kit, I'll go shoot and then I'll pay you as well. I think I paid him 300 bucks. Here you go, here's all my kit, so I'm not gonna go off and steal your kit, kit sorry. And then I went, shot the match, came back, everything was good and yeah, sometimes things like that happen. So literally 10% of what we do is taking photos, 90% is problem solving and particularly when you're abroad, there's always hiccups, there's always things happening. You know, the stress we all get put under when 4G or 5G or stadium Wi-Fi is not working and you're trying to get pictures out and it's all crashing and often out at Homebush at the main stadium there, when you have 70,000 there and 50 photographers, you know, things don't work and it's frustrating because you just want to get a picture out and sometimes you can't and, you know, all you want to do is focus on taking photographs but you can't when there's all this peripheral stuff going on that affects how you operate. Yes? Uh, just quickly, um, obviously travelling a lot and going to big events, uh, how do you do work-life balance as being there with your girls? Yeah, it is hard. Um, basically, when you're away, it sucks because you miss your family. And I think when my kids were really little, they're five and six now, but when they were really little, you know, you get all emotional because you're gone and they, they get upset when you leave. But I think now it's getting a little bit easier and you FaceTime non-stop now, you know, you're always sending little videos and the good thing is when you're at these big events, all your colleagues, or well not all of them, but a good majority of them all are in the similar boat where they all have family they're left behind or partners or pets or whatever and you're all going through it together so you can look after each other and, you know, we all talk about our families when we're away and stuff. Um, but yeah, I think it is tricky, but when I'm back, I get stupid amounts of time with my family compared to anyone else like... Uh, say tomorrow, right, I'm doing a rugby league match, tonight I'm doing Sydney Swans, and like tomorrow I get the whole day with my family, and then I head off to work at 5 o'clock at night, come home at 11, they're in bed asleep anyway, and I still get the day to go do swimming lessons and football and whatever, so it is pretty cool, there is a good balance there, and when we're away you get days off, extra days off and stuff when you're travelling just because it is taxing when, you, when you're gone for big chunks of time, but for example I'm going to World Athletics, which is in Portland, Oregon in July and that's three weeks and then work said look can you go on from there to Birmingham to do the Com Games and that would suddenly turn a three week trip into a seven week trip and I'm like it's not going to work this time and the good thing is I think all companies not just Getty Images have identified how important work life balance is and that family first is a you know big thing that companies are trying to push on people now and it's like if you uh, don't want to go, you're not going to not get an opportunity the next time and everyone's at different chapters in their life with family like the guys who have you know 20, 20 plus year old kids are like yeah I'll go, I'm, I'm gone you know and they, they jump on everything but for me at the moment you know it's finding that balance and you know I had to say no to the Rugby World Cup in the UK because we were having our first child and that was hard because I love photographing rugby and got massive FOMO seeing it all on TV and then you go, you know what, I went to Tokyo to the next one and 
I already forgot about that one. You know, things happen so quick, and there's always more opportunities. So, you know, we all we all miss stuff, but yeah, it's not so bad. Yeah, sure. Yes. If you were to redo your journey in this day and age, yep. where would you begin? Uh, it's a good question. I think uh, there's no right or wrong passage to get to where you want to get, but the main thing is just to reach out to professionals and those who matter will give you their time and those who are too busy or too cool, ignore them. You know, they, they're not going to give you advice that's worthwhile anyway, right? And I feel like at this stage of my career, I, I try to give back and I think a lot of people my age do because I remember when I was starting out and got opportunities from City Morning Herald photographers in particular who took me under their wing, you know, when I was starting out doing work experience and stuff. And I think they were trailblazers in the early 2000s, late 90s in terms of how they were photographing sport in a kind of artistic way and they inspired the next generation of photographers. Um, and yeah, I guess thinking about a long-term goal to where, uh, or a plan where you go, you know what, I'm not going to make money to, you know, pay to live by being an influencer on Instagram. It's like such a small per percentage of people can do that. So I know lots of kids now that want to be, you know, super popular and super, uh, you know, handing stuff out on Instagram all the time. And that's, that doesn't have longevity to it. So I think it's about thinking more about a long-term game plan in terms of how can I get into any industry, work my way up, you know, I couldn't reach out to say one of the best, like Marco Grob, awesome uh, portrait photographer, I couldn't reach out to him 10 years ago because I wouldn't know where to find him, but now I can DM him on Instagram going, hey mate, love your work, just wanted to know how you did this and you know, he'll reply to me and like sometimes people don't reply but sometimes they do and you know, ask the questions and just immerse yourself in content, right? If it's photography you like to do, you know, there's plenty of people out there that'll give back. And it's also, I guess, just believing in something enough. If you're hungry, it'll work out, right? And there were years there where I worked in a petrol station, uh, you know, as a console operator, and I'd do the odd freelance job, and then I'd go out and shoot stuff just in my own time. But that's how you're going to improve, right? You still need money to pay for things. So, you know, I'm in a job that's not glamorous at all, but at least it paid some bills. But then I was out there chasing it, you know what I mean? And then opportunities do work out if you're hungry and you have the right attitude. I think another thing on that, just to finish with this, is, you know, Getty Images in a lot of places, you know, we kind of have a no dickhead policy, which sounds harsh, but it's like, you could be the best photographer in the world, but if you've got the wrong attitude, no one wants to work with you. So, you know, we want to work with people who are passionate and have a good attitude and are positive and are willing to learn and take constructive feedback. And if you uh, think you're a rock star and you know, when I started, I thought I knew how to photograph a rugby match and then 20 years later, I feel like I'm still learning and I think that's key. Like, you keep learning, you keep evolving, you keep changing the way you do things and, yeah, just to take, I guess, feedback on board and ask questions. Yeah. Guys, I think we probably have to wrap it up. Cool, yeah. All right. <laughs>